for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson decided to go on a camping trip. After dinner and a bottle of wine, they laid down for the night and went to sleep. Some hours later, Holmes awoke, nudged his faithful friend and said, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Dr. Watson replied, I see millions of stars. Holmes then asked him, what does that tell you? Dr. Watson pondered for a minute before answering. Astronomically, it tells me that there are billions of galaxies and potentially trillions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Meteorologically, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. And theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. What does it tell you, Holmes? Sherlock Holmes was silent for a moment, then spoke. Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. Other than a well-equipped RV or a fully loaded trailer, a tent is the most important thing, the most important piece of equipment that a person can bring on a camping trip. In short, a tent is one's home away from home because other than from falling trees or lightning strikes, tents provide protection from most of the elements that Mother Nature can throw a person's way, including, it would seem, the occasional bear attack. Let me explain. Steve Herrero, who has spent his entire adult life working as a bear behavioral scientist and biologist, writes on page 125 of his 2002 book, Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidance. I have mentioned that another technique for minimizing risk while backcountry camping around bears is to sleep in a tent rather than without shelter. Sleeping under the stars is one of my favorite things to do while camping, but I choose areas in which to do this carefully. My data suggests that people sleeping without tents were more likely to be injured, even killed by bears, than were people who slept in tents. Regardless, most of the time campers just go inside their tents to sleep and really don't think too much about it. Occasionally, however, they either get caught in a rainstorm or the bugs become so fierce that campers need to spend a few hours hiding inside the relative protective confines of their tents. At those times, there's nothing more satisfying than hearing the torrential downpour on the outside of the tent, but being bone dry on the inside or listening to the terrifying symphony of mosquitoes that would literally suck the campers dry if only they could get at them. But knowing that the bugs can't get through the impenetrable armor of the tent's nylon walls. To be sure, uh, sure therefore, when camping, having a tent means being protected. It's not surprising, then, that tents are mentioned throughout Holy Scripture for the same reason. Take, for example, the Tent of Meeting from the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Tent of Meeting was the place where Yahweh, which is the Old Testament name for God, would meet with and be a constant source of protection for his people Israel. Now, usually the name the Tent of Meeting was used synonymously for the Tabernacle of Moses. But before the tabernacle was constructed, Yahweh met with Moses in a temporary tent of meeting, as per Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 and 9, which state, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance, while the Lord spoke with Moses. After the tabernacle was built, however, Moses no longer needed this temporary tent. Consequently, the expression tent of meeting began to be applied to the tabernacle. 
Furthermore, as part of the laws that Yahweh gave to Moses in Exodus chapters 25 to 27, Yahweh also provided specific and detailed instructions on how to build his holy place of worship. Most notably, perhaps, this tent of meeting or tabernacle could be taken down and moved each time the nation of Israel changed locations during its 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The word tabernacle, by the way, is the English translation of the Hebrew word miskan, which means dwelling place. Thus, the tabernacle was intended to be a temporary dwelling place and to provide protection against the elements for the Ark of the Covenant and other holy items that the Israelites were instructed to use in their proper worship of and sacrifice to Yahweh, their God and protector until a more permanent worship space was built about 400 years later, with the completion under King Solomon's reign of Yahweh's first temple in Jerusalem, circa 980 BC. Interestingly, the words tent and tabernacle are also used throughout the New Testament. For example, throughout uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1-5, to St. Paul uses the word tent to denote the earthly human body. He writes, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed than mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Again, when St. Paul says the tent that is our earthly home, he is referring to our earthly body, our temporary dwelling place, our tabernacle, if you will. Also, when St. Paul says, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee, he is referring to God's gift to us of his Holy Spirit as comforter and protector. And just as the Israelites moved the tent of meeting from place to place, waiting for entrance to the promised land, believers in Jesus Christ are merely wanderers on the earth. In short, they are people who are not at home in this world and who need constant protection from it. Moreover, St. Paul promises that those who belong to God will be further clothed with immortality upon their deaths, and that their frail earthly tents, their bodies, will be replaced with permanent heavenly dwellings. Furthermore, God himself does all the work of preparing us for that day of glorification while we struggle here on earth through the continual process of sanctification and comfort and protection by his Holy Spirit. Finally, that constant work happening within us is Almighty God's guarantee that both our eternal inheritance and our heavenly dwelling are very real. As St. Paul promises us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 15, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Did you know that most conservative biblical scholars believe that St. Paul wrote his epistle to the Ephesians circa 60 AD while he was being held prisoner awaiting his first trial in Rome. And that when St. Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20 regarding the armor of God, that is today's epistle lesson, he had drawn inspiration from the Roman soldiers who had been assigned to guard him. Specifically, St. Paul used the armor of the Roman soldier as a metaphor to illustrate a spiritual truth that throughout life's struggles, God has given us spiritual armor to protect the tents of our earthly bodies as we wage war against the dark spiritual forces that assail us every day. Now, I fully realize that we live in a world that operates on hard facts, such that the spiritual side of life seems so unreal in this age of computers and cell phones and social media. 
Nonetheless, the spiritual world, which includes the forces of light and darkness, is very much a reality. Accordingly, St. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, warning them about the real enemy of their faith, a dangerous foe that must be continually fought on a spiritual battlefield. In so doing, St. Paul reminds them and us that the true struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against dark spiritual forces. In verse 12, St. Paul uses the term powers of this dark world to aptly describe Satan's demonic forces. Interestingly, fear was not an issue to St. Paul, but deception was. Likewise, St. Paul firmly believed in the reality of Satan's existence. As a result, his instruction to the Ephesian church in verse 11 was to be aware of the devil's schemes, to stand strong against the one who desired above all to destroy their eternal lives, and to understand the need to use spiritual armor to effectively battle with him. Consequently, St. Paul uses an example which was familiar to his audience, the Roman soldier and his armor. Without protective armor, a soldier was as good as dead in the heat of a battle. Similarly, St. Paul challenged his readers either to fight their spiritual battles covered with Jesus as their protection or to expect ineffective ministries and defeated lives. Clearly then, St. Paul's intention was to give all true Christian believers a method for spiritual victory. The belt was foundational for battle. In short, it supported the weapons that allowed the soldier to fight. The belt of truth, in verse 14, is a reminder that Jesus Christ is the foundation for spiritual battle. For not only is Jesus, according to St. John chapter 14, verse 6, the way and the life, he is the truth who stands against the lies and the deception of Satan. Thus, to win our spiritual battles, we must be anchored to the truth found in Jesus Christ alone. The function of the breastplate was basically to protect the soldier's vital organs in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. The breastplate was essential for survival, and no trained Roman soldier would venture into battle without it. If we start to believe that our own righteousness or effort or good works can make us worthy of God's protection, the advantage quickly changes to benefit our enemy. In short, our righteousness is worthless in the battle. We need to get our eyes off ourselves and back on the provision of the cross. And the breastplate of righteousness in verse 14 that is ours through our living relationship with Jesus Christ. Without his sandals, a soldier would not be prepared to fight and could be easily defeated. St. Paul tells us in verse 15 that our preparation for battle is to be shod with the gospel, that is to say the good news of peace. The gospel being Jesus' meritorious life, his precious death, his mighty resurrection, and his glorious ascension. For Jesus' reconciling work while he was here on earth brought us peace, eternal peace, with God. And it is precisely this reconciliation through Jesus Christ that allows us to fight with boldness and with confidence and with perseverance and with peace. The only protection against the flaming arrows that rained down from the sky in ancient warfare was the shield. If used correctly, the shield was a trustworthy piece of equipment. If dropped, however, it became useless, and the soldier's fate rested with himself. Hence, as St. Paul urges in verse 16, we must take up the shield of faith and trust in Jesus alone to protect us, for we cannot rely on our own abilities in this spiritual battle. The helmet was absolutely indispensable for the survival of a soldier in battle. Therefore, St. Paul, in using the term helmet of salvation in verse 17, is signifying that the Helmet of Christ's salvation is the only source of true and total deliverance. 
that in Jesus Christ alone, all true Christians will find their total deliverance. In every situation, spiritual and emotional and physical, Jesus alone has to be our source, our guide, and our way out, as we are quite simply unable to deliver ourselves. These five pieces of armor were all primarily used for defensive purposes. Consequently, if we take St. Paul's sage advice in verses 11 to 16 to stand firm and to allow God to fight for us, our spiritual armor, the armor of God, will defend and protect us. Conversely, the sword of the Spirit, in verse 17, is the only piece of armor used for offensive purposes, and it is all we need. When used at close range by a skilled Roman soldier, the sword was a deadly weapon. To St. Paul, the sword represents the Word of God, the written picture of Jesus Christ. For Jesus is the living version of everything that God wanted to say to humankind. Indeed, God's Word is the most powerful weapon against the enemy, but only when it is used under the Holy Spirit's power and direction, that is. Unfortunately, I firmly believe that Christians, generally speaking, are far too ignorant of the Word of God, and that, to put it rather bluntly, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church early needs to get into spiritual shape. I mean, it only makes sense that any protection afforded by armor, including the armor of God, would ultimately be rendered useless without a sword, for the enemy would just keep attacking and hacking until the armor eventually gave way. According to Tom Fillinger, a specialist in the field of church revitalization, Christian churches across America are facing a real crisis in terms of biblical literacy. Specifically, Fillinger notes with real sadness that the United States of America has become a nation of biblical illiterates. Similarly, in regards to biblical illiteracy and discipleship, Christian researcher and author George Barna conducted a survey in 2002 of self-pronounced Christians, and here's a sampling of what he found about their biblical knowledge. 45% could not name the four Gospels. 52% could not identify more than two or three of Jesus' apostles. 60% could not name even five of the Ten Commandments. 61% thought that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. 60% completely rejected the existence of Satan. 54% believed that real truth can only be discovered through logic and human reasoning and personal experience. 50% believe that anyone who is generally good or does enough good things for others during his or her life will, get this, earn a place in heaven. 40% believe that while Jesus Christ lived on earth, he committed sins. And that the Bible and the Koran and the Book of Mormon are all different expressions of the same spiritual truths. And finally, only 10% of respondents, that's just one person in 10, based their moral decision-making on the principles taught in the Bible. Incidentally, I highly suspect that these figures would not be any better if a similar study was replicated today, and more to the point, in Canadian churches. In any case, in summarizing the results of his research, George Barna admitted in echoing Tom Fillinger's sentiments as expressed a few moments ago, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large they don't know what it says. And because they don't know it, they have become a nation of biblical illiterates. Once again, I emphatically believe that the same would be said if a similar study was done today in Canadian churches. Hence, it is vital that all true Christians are well acquainted with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, 
because the Holy Bible, Holy Scripture, is all we need to thwart Satan's schemes. However, we need to know it cold, and we need to know how to use it and how to apply it. For Satan, the real enemy, is crafty. When he tempted Jesus in the wilderness in St. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, Satan actually quoted Holy Scripture, albeit out of context. However, Jesus, the Word of God, knew his Holy Scripture fully, and he completely undid Satan by properly applying it. However, Satan is relentless. He does not give up easily. And I fear that in today's world, the devil is rapidly gaining ground. All because self-professed Christians no longer care to read, let alone know, their Bibles. It seems as if they are blissfully unaware that there is even a battle going on and that they are in the very midst of that raging battle, unprotected. It's rather like camping without a tent, except that being devoured by a bear or a swarm of voracious mosquitoes would seem like a walk in the park by comparison. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen.